academics. Our speakers, His Excellency Ambassador Rukashev and former minister in the presidency, Dr. Pahad, and Khadija Patel, editor of the Mail and the Guardian, representatives of various embassies and high commissions, staff students from UJ and other institutions, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our seminar on Russia-Africa relations in the 21st century, renewed focus and engagement. The Center for Africa-China Studies was established just for one year, so it's the celebration of our center. Uh, our center is to fulfill the goal of achieving greater understanding of China and Africa individually, as well as the relationship between two of them. But we have a broader interest in Africa's other relationships with the global south. One of the platforms in which the continent has relations with the emerging nation is BRICS. Also, Russia and China has a very good relationship and it's one of the most important partners of China. This is why we have today convened this seminar. As many may be aware, last month saw the first ever Russia-Africa summit and economic forum was held in the Russian Federation on the 22nd and 24th of October, co-chaired by Russian president, Egyptian president, and African Union chairman. The summit was very well attended and saw 43 African heads of states and government as well as representatives of major African regional and sub-regional organizations. Most importantly, participants adopted a declaration and spelled out a comprehensive framework of intensified cooperation between Russia and Africa in the security, trade, and economic fields. In today's seminar, His Excellency Mr. Rogashev, Ambassador of the Russian Federation to Peoples of South Africa, and the Minister Pahad will explore the implication of this milestone event for Africa and South Africa. I would like to now introduce Ms. Khadija Patel, Editor-in-Chief of the Mail and Guardian, who will chair today's discussion. Since 2015, Khadija has been a research associate with Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research at University of Wits. Khadija previously worked at the Daily Maverick, where she was a senior reporter, focusing on international relations. Her experience also extends to publishing a committee magazine that was distributed nationally. She was also being published internationally by Al Jazeera and The Guardian. Since 2016, she has been editor-in-chief of The Mail and the Guardian. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Patel. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so, uh, yes, I am the editor in chief of the Mail and Guardian for my sins. Um, and I'm um, really looking forward to the discussion um, this morning. I think that it is um, an important discussion and heartened to see uh, you know, many colleagues here from foreign embassies and hoping for a very open uh, discussion. Um, but it is also a very timely discussion. Um, you know, as, you know, as I walked in, um, we noted that you know, the university is quite empty. Um, students are studying, or we're hoping so. Um, and, you know, as the year draws to a close, um, there is also, a, you know, there's great moments, or it's important to have a moment of reflection 
um, on where we are, um, you know, a as a global community. Um, certainly, uh, you know, they are, you know, they're not any morning do I wake up with m not some troubling headlines from somewhere in the world. Um, so there is, uh, you know, there is certainly an urgency for us to reflect deeply on how nations um, and regions really interact with each other. So um, let's hope that, that you know, this discussion this morning brings us closer to some understanding, certainly, of how Russia um, intends to uh, you know, expand or renew its engagement with the African continent um, in the coming year. Um, you know, as the previous speaker said, um, you know, the summit in Sochi last uh, month um, was really interesting and certainly was well attended. Um, for me, one of the most interesting quotes to have come out of it was actually from President Putin, um, who said in, an, in, in a media interview, Indeed, interest in developing the relations with African countries is currently visible not only on the part of Western Europe, the US and China, but also on the part of India, Turkey, the Gulf states, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Israel, and Brazil. This is not accidental, he said, as Africa increasingly becomes a continent of opportunities. And I think that it's exactly that uh, phrase, the continent of opportunities, that I hope we can unpack today, um, but I think that something else uh, you know, President Putin said there was also interesting. He said that Russia's engagement with Africa will be different. He said Russia was going to be a different kind of superpower, one that does not engage in pressure, intimidation, and blackmail to exploit sovereign African governments. Our African agenda, he said, is positive and future-oriented. We do not ally with someone against someone else, and we strongly oppose any geopolitical games involving Africa. So that's certainly very meaty and a lot to chew on in itself. Um, but to take us further in, um, you know, into what exactly is driving Russian engagement in Africa right now, I'm delighted to introduce um, his, Axley, his Excellency Ambassador Rogashev, um, who has uh, you know, has been here in South Africa since July this year. He's a graduate of the Moscow State Institute, and he joined the diplomatic service in 1984. Uh, from 2004 to 2009, he was deputy permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations, and he was also the deputy permanent representative to the UN Security Council. From 2009 to 2019, sorry, this is what happens when um, you're really tired after a deadline. You just tend to stutter in the morning. Um, from 2009 to 2019, he was director of the Department on New Challenges and Threats at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. And like I said, he's been here in South Africa since July this year. Ambassador Rakushev, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the inaugural Russia-Africa summit took place in Sochi on the 23rd and 24th of October, and also dozens of highest level bilateral meetings were held on the sidelines. The summit was preceded by the Russia-Africa Economic Forum that uh, involved business people from all across the African continent and various regions of Russia. 54 African nations were represented at these events. There's a little discrepancy between my figures and the figures of uh, Professor in her welcoming uh, address. 47 heads of state and government, 43 heads of state and four heads of government, two vice presidents, uh, eight heads of the executive bodies of African regional organizations, including SATC, participated in the summit. The Russian leadership was in attendance as well with uh, President Putin helming these events, deputy prime minister and 11 ministers of the Russian government engaging in the talks and uh, deliberations. The summit and the forum marked a true milestone in Russia-Africa relations. Uh, let's be frank, 
Since the collapse of the Soviet Union for many years, Russia could not afford to focus its attention on Africa as much as we did in the time of the USSR. I would like to stress that the 1990s were a period of serious hardships and challenges for my country, and for a long time we had to look inward to fix the problems that arose during that tumultuous period. As a result, our close partnership with African nations went on a hiatus. Though the friendship between our countries never ceased to exist. Russia-Africa relations have always been based on long-standing traditions of friendship and solidarity formed back when my country supported the struggle of the peoples of Africa against colonialism, racism and apartheid, helped establish statehood and build foundations of the national economies and protect their independence and sovereignty. Our, spe our specialists built major infrastructure facilities, including power plants, steel mills, and dams, and thousands of Africans received high-quality education and professional training in the Soviet Union and then Russia. Only recently, Russia has written off over 20 billion in US dollars of debt of the African states to assist in their development. As Russia gathered its strength and built up the potential, we can finally say out loud, we are back, Russia is returning to Africa. Returning to resume from the point where we have left it off, once again renew our friendly relations and pick up the pace of cooperation. I will not exaggerate by saying that expanding beneficial ties with African states is one of the priorities of Russia's foreign policy and a huge focus for us going forward. The events in Sochi bear high symbolic significance. Not only our nations have returned, have reunited once again in the goal to build a better common future, uh, we are doing this as partners on an equal footing and based on the tried and true trust that we share. It is no coincidence that the summit was jointly hosted by both the Russian Federation and the African Union. This is a strong message that I'm certain the African nations heard loud and clear, and an indication of the way Russia does things on the international arena with respect and full consideration of each other's interests. The program of the summit and forum was rather intensive. Many business meetings as well as in-depth discussions took place and governmental officials, uh, officials, captains of industry and entrepreneurs, experts and specialists discussed Russia-Africa partnership and cooperation, its current state and prospects in detail. Panels and round tables on various topics were held in Sochi with uh, 268 speakers representing a broad spectrum of opinions and points of view. This was a platform for every voice to be heard. The outcomes and positive are positive and in many aspects uh, very practical. The leaders adopted the declaration of the first Russia-Africa summit, which sets goals and objectives for further development of our cooperation in trade, economy, security, as well as uh, scientific, cultural, and humanitarian spheres. Many important agreements were signed. To enumerate a few, I would highlight the following two major MOUs that establish the framework for enhancing cooperation. One is Memorandum of Understanding between the Government of the Russian Federation and the African Union on basic principles of relations and cooperation. And another one is Memorandum of Understanding between the Eurasian Economic Commission and the African Union on Economic Cooperation. A total of 500 agreements, including 92 contracts, were inked in Sochi. Together, these documents amount to over 15 billion in US dollars in investment. If we look uh, at the specific areas, most of the documents signed were in export and foreign trade, high-tech, transport and logistics, mineral resources, geological exploration and banking. 
These include the construction of a new oil refinery in Morocco, railroads in Egypt, fertilizer plant in Angola, manufacturing of robotics in Nigeria and others. At the same time, the majority of the agreements do not necessarily have numerical value attached to them, but pave way for large contracts to be signed in the follow-up. These include MOUs on cooperation in energy generation, including nuclear energy. An intergovernmental agreement on cooperation in the peaceful use of nuclear energy was signed with Ethiopia, as well as agreements with Rwanda and Zambia to build a center for nuclear science and technologies. Issues of security on the African continent were also one of the important points of discussions in Sochi. Uh, you cannot have consistent economic growth without ensuring the security of your countries and its people. We have the expertise in many of these fields and are ready to assist Africa in tackling these problems. The reaction and perception of the Russia-Africa summit and its outcomes so far have been positive. We are seeing our partners hailing the initiatives and projects proposed in Sochi, ready to commence their practical realization. At the same time, certain media outlets, mostly in the West, launched a smear campaign against Russia for renewing its close ties with the African nations. Sadly, uh, but some of the Western-oriented South African press pitched in using the exact same cliches and unsubstantiated allegations as their senior partners across the Atlantic Ocean. First of all, I would address them and say thank you for acknowledging the success of the summit and the forum. There is no better affirmation that this biased and morbid reaction that we did our job right. They call it Russia's scramble for Africa. I think that the way these media try to mar Russia-Africa cooperation speaks volumes, not about Russia and Africa as such, but first and foremost about the mindset of certain political and media circles in the West. From this you can clearly see how they perceive Africa and the Africans. For them, Africa is a geopolitical playground, a treasury of resources to be plundered, and potential to be tapped. In their minds, Russia is a competitor. They cannot tolerate that someone would think differently. And they try to teach and admonish Africans about how they should run things, with whom to partner or not. Uh, we, reje we reject this kind of thinking. This is not and has never been our line of thought. In our minds, Africa and Russia are partners in building a better future for our peoples and there is plenty of room for cooperation and growth for everyone. The multipolar world is no longer a concept, but a reality. Apparently, not everyone can take it as a fact. We are frank in what we have to offer. It is up for the African nations themselves to decide whether they are interested or not. Unlike our partners in the West, we never strong arm or pull hidden strings. With Russia, that what you see is what you get. There is no doubt that the summit opened a new era in uh, Russia-Africa cooperation. Uh, it uh, concluded in a cordial, constructive, and transparent atmosphere. The natural question would be, where do we go from here? The answer was enshrined in the summit declaration itself. Forward towards a better future. To achieve that, Russia-Africa Partnership Forum is established. This will be an uh, ongoing uh, platform and mechanism of furthering cooperation. Summits are planned to be held every three years on a rotating basis. So the next one will likely take place on the African continent and in between the summits, uh, ministerial talks will be held twice a year with the Russian foreign minister and foreign ministers of the current preceding and succeeding chairs of the African Union participating. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the summit is not our momentary whim or an attempt to cash in on the nostalgia. What we did is we've put on the table an honest proposition to elevate our relations to a whole new level, update them to the current day standards so that they meet interest of all sides. Russia and Africa share not only close historical ties and common struggle, we share a vision of the future and enjoy similar approaches towards international cooperation and views on many global challenges. I am certain that we have all the ingredients needed to face these challenges together and together overcome them. We have everything necessary to ensure a prosperous future for our nations and its peoples. The framework has been set. Now it is up to us to realize the potential and it is time for hard work and we're ready for it. I thank you. I love speakers who don't need to be told to stick to time. So thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, our next speaker, however, has told me to uh, prod him uh, to to stay within his time limit. Um, in many ways, um, Minister Esop Pahad needs no introduction. Um, he was in exile during the anti-apartheid struggle. He holds a PhD from the University of Sussex. He is a former minister in the presidency under former President Thabo Mbeki, and he held that position from 1998 to 2009. Dr. Pahad is also the chairman of the board of the South Africa Mali Timbuktu Manuscripts Trust, as well as the chairman of the board of trustees of the South African Democracy Education Trust. He was the founder and editor of the Pan-African Quarterly, The Thinker, which as of this year resides here at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Pahad. I always respect chiefs. Since you are an editor-in-chief, I better respect you, Khatija. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Rogachev, for your very interesting input in relation to the conference that was held in Sochi. But in my response, I want to start somewhere else. And where I want to start is with the Soviet Union. And I know you've mentioned the Soviet Union, that, and I think you are right, that for whatever reason Russia did not, and I'll come back to that, use certain things following the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'd like to go back to Egypt in 1956. You will recall that at that time, the UK, France, and Israel launched an aggression and an attack upon NASA's Egypt, ostensibly to keep the Swiss Canal open, but essentially to remove what they considered to be a very powerful progressive personality in the Middle East, which is always an important region in international politics. It was, in many ways, the intervention of the Soviet Union that helped to save Egypt. Because those three powerful forces then had to withdraw their occupation troops from Egypt, and Egypt was able to try to develop on its own path. And that intervention by the Soviet Union, in my view, had a profound impact on the African continent. Now remember this is 1956, it's only in 1960 that you have this wave of decolonization that takes place on the African continent. And I, in my view, it gave a tremendous impetus to the anti-colonial struggle uh, on the African continent. I would argue, Ambassador, that the Soviet Union had developed and worked hard to have very close, friendly, and 
other relations with the African continent and the collapse of the Soviet Union, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, in my view, Russia failed to utilize that goodwill and friendship that existed between so many African countries and the Soviet Union, for whatever reason. And you mentioned that, and it's true that the Soviet Union was a powerful supporter of our own struggle in South Africa, certainly in Lerpat, in Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Principe in Sao Tome, Angola, where it was the intervention of the Cuban troops in Angola, supported by the Soviet Union, which prevented the apartheid regime from occupying Angola. They actually came on the outskirts of Luanda. So I think it's very important for us to understand what that role was. If we fast forward to more recent times, I think it's reasonable to argue that had it not been for the support and the intervention of Russia, Assad would have been overthrown in Syria. Neither Assad nor his military forces had the capacity to be able to withstand the onslaught from, and I believe they were used for that purpose, uh, some of the uh, Islamic jihadist movements. And it is clear that once Russia had decided to intervene in a very strong way in support of the Assad government, that that enabled the Assad government to withstand that end in the end at the moment to defeat the forces that want to overthrow it. Another element of the Soviet Union which is not sufficiently discussed is that many social scientists in the Soviet Union with the support of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union helped us to theorize many aspects of our struggle on the African continent. If you look at the declarations of the Communist and Workers' Parties that was held in 1960 and then in 1969, you will find there that the notion and the concept of a national democratic society, of a national democratic revolution was taken there. And it was those ideological and theoretical positions which enabled many people in Africa to begin to understand what then was going to be the main content of the struggle in the continent. In my view, that remains still true till today. That's why in South Africa, at least in the African National Congress, we will talk about creating a national democratic society. And that important part of the contribution that the Soviet Union made, I think, no longer exists. We don't have that same contribution from social scientists in Russia to help, not to determine, but to help us in the continent to theorize the nature and content of our own struggle. Moreover, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the other socialist countries in, in Europe, I think also have led to, laid the foundation for what is happening today in Europe, which is this grotesque shift to the right in electoral politics in a number of countries in Western Europe. We also have this anomalous position where NATO, which was ostensibly set up in opposition to the Warsaw Pact, was not only continued, 
But NATO was expanded to include Poland, the Czech Republic in that. What for? If NATO was formed in order to rebuff the Warsaw Pact, and the Soviet Union and the socialist countries no longer exist, what do you need NATO for? And why do you need to expand NATO in Europe? And I believe that it's essentially designed also to try to see to what extent they'll be able to forestall any serious progressive changes in, in Europe and still to be areas from which anti-Russian positions can be taken. And when Poland demands that the United States must put even more modernized nuclear weapons on their territory, against who is this supposed to be? So I think that in a way, the end, so-called end of the Cold War has made international politics less safe, has made the world a less safe place for all of us. And in that context, the importance of Russia as a kind of bulwark, and it's an old word that I'm using, it's a well-worn word, but as a kind of bulwark against reactionary tendencies and which are de designed to prevent serious progressive change from taking place on the African continent, that we should then be able to resist those. At a time when the Trump administration in the United States is determined to pursue an America first policy, to pursue essentially a protectionist policy, and to take positions, and I'll come back to some of them, on some of the most vital questions facing us in the world, which will not contribute to world peace, but I think will contribute to enhancing and increasing tensions. And I'll come back to that. So today we have BRICS, which has just had its uh, meeting in uh, Brazil. Now BRICS must play a very important role, should play a very important role. But the Bra president of Brazil is so right-wing that if he shifted a little bit more right to, to the right, he'll fall off the cliff. India has a prime minister whose political roots lies in the RSS, which was set up as a pro-fascist organization. It still is. And its raison d'etat is an anti-Muslim thing. This is what the RSS was set up for. Modi's political roots are in the RSS. His party, BJP, which is the governing party in India, draws its main strength from the RSS. And so we need to understand when we're talking about BRICS that two of the major countries in BRICS are governed by, at this moment in time, pretty right-wing elements. And therefore, in that sense, it seems to me that the relationship between China and Russia is absolutely critical for us to be able to seriously pursue the course of multilateralism in the context of United States administration, which seems to be more interested in unilateralism imposing its own positions and policies. Because for us in the world, multilateralism quite clearly must be the way forward. And we therefore need both China and Russia 
to begin to play an even more active role in pushing for multilateralism in the world. For me, one of, if not, the most important international issue, and one of them, is the issue of the struggle of the Palestinians for national liberation, independence, freedom, and democracy. We now have a situation in which the Trump administration has just taken a decision, quite again unilaterally, to say that Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories is not in violation of international law. But that position is also a position of the UN General Assembly. That it is, it is a violation of international law. It's in violation of any reasonable international norms and standards. So not only did they first recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, they now take a position against even their allies in NATO and, and in Europe and elsewhere that uh, the Israeli occupation and the building of settlements is not against international law. And so we are in a very dangerous situation here because strengthening the reactionary regime in Israel, and it comes at a time, by the way, when Netanyahu has lost an election, when the Israelis are trying to form some kind of right-wing government, and this, I think, is designed to project Netanyahu as a more powerful force than even the Israeli electorate wanted. So I think it's in this context that we need to think about how we can expand and extend our international solidarity with the people of Palestine, with the Palestinians. Now, it doesn't matter what one's politics are, because both the United States of America and Russia remain the two most powerful thermonuclear powers in the world. Now, it has been an accepted fact, for as long as I can know, that one of the main things that we would want in the world is to prevent a nuclear war between the United States, at that time the Soviet Union, and now Russia. Because nobody in the world will remain unscathed if a thermonuclear war takes place between these two major nuclear powers. So clearly it's important for all of us that the relationship between Russia and the United States should not be one where it is full of tension. And right now it seems to me that because there are forces in the West who always need a bogus enemy. So in the beginning it was communism, you know. So you must fight communism. That was the Soviet Union, socialist countries. Then of course Cuba remains for the conservative and reactionary forces in the United States of America, something that they need to destroy. But it seems to me that in the world what we need is for Russia and the United States to have reasonably good relationships so that the possibilities of a thermonuclear war breaking out between these two nuclear powers recedes into the background. Now, if you've been watching TV and watching this uh, impeachment of uh, President Trump. Yesterday was very funny, and interesting too. They were not talking about Trump, those people. They were talking about Russian aggression in Ukraine. So I was listening and saying, but what has this got to do with the impeachment of Trump? And you had these so-called former leaders in, in, in the U.S. State Department and, and National Security Council 
brazenly talking about Russian aggression. And you ask yourself when you watch him, what is this aggression? Have Russia attacked the United States? And again, that's because they do need these external enemies to continue to whip up support within the more conservative and right-wing elements in the United States of America and in the rest of the world. So I think for us, when we look at Africa-China relations, at the same time, we need to understand it's a good thing for us if Russia and the United States are able to have good relations. It's a good thing for us if China and the United States have good relations. At the moment, the relations are a bit sour. Why? Because again, unilaterally, the Trump administration is imposing tariffs on uh, goods and services from China, forcing other countries in the world not to accede to China's advance in what they call the 5G. So we are in a situation in which we have a US administration which seems determined to pursue its own path, which seems determined to impose its own will on too many countries. And so we need then to find a way in which in this world, the, in my view, the progressive forces will need to find a way in which we are able to resist working with other progressive forces in the world this very reactionary tendency within the Trump administration. And you will see I'm talking about the Trump administration. I'm not talking about the United States. I'm not talking about the people of the United States. Lastly, for me, of course, obviously, the people of the United States supported our struggle against apartheid and racism. But at the time when the US administration is ready at the stroke of a pen to impose sanctions on whoever they seem that they don't like, I want you to understand that it took us donkey's years before we could convince the Thatcher administration in the United Kingdom and the US administration, successive US administrations from imposing sanctions on apartheid South Africa. And in fact, President Oliver Tambo was only able to meet the US Secretary of State much later he used to go to the United States of America to do meetings, but no US administration official would meet him. For them, the African National Congress was a communist dominated organization, was a lackey of the Soviet Union. And I think we need to understand this and remember this, that when we're trying to understand what is going on in the world today. So in conclusion, I would say that it is very important for Russia to be actively involved in the continent, for Russia to support the continent in its own endeavors to improve the quality of life of our people, but at the same time, for Russia, China, the others, to begin to assert their own influence on international developments so that we are able to resist this what I would call an onslaught from right wing reactionary and conservative forces on progressive change in our continent and in the world. Thank you. Um, so we are now into um, the more engaging part of the program where we are going to allow um, a number of questions. Um, I certainly have a few questions as well, but I'm going to allow the audience to ask their questions first. Uh, thank you very much. Um, John Rowett. I'm president of Africa Gains Foundation and professor at the University of Oxford. Um, I wanted to pick up on the issue of infrastructure and infrastructural investment. We all know that this century is a century of African urbanization. Half of the cities in which Africans will live at the end of this century have yet to be built. So there's a huge infrastructure need. If we get it wrong, it will be that dystopian notion of cities of slums. There's no country, there's no one country 
that can meet the Africa infrastructure needs for urbanization. But there is expertise that is there, and in particular, I think of the Moscow Urban Forum, which has established itself as a major center for the discussion, particularly around technology and smart cities. So I was interested whether in the discussions that took place at the conference, there was a focus on infrastructural investment in cities. And then say, related to that, and it, it's picking up on SOP too, given that there is no one country that can make these investments, to what extent do you see a possibility, not just for the collaboration between Russia and China, um, collaboration with Turkey, for example, around this, but actually collaboration with the European Union and with the US because there are real infrastructure areas of expertise and investment there and perhaps working at that level away from the ideological conflicts might actually be beneficial to the continent and to the development of this multiplex world. Thank you. Thank you, Khadija, and Excellency, thank you so much for the input and to Dr. Pahad. Very interesting. Excellency, I wanted to pick up on one element that you didn't expand much on, but which I, I think is still at the heart of some of the crossover between your input and that of Dr. Pahad, and that's on the security element of Russia's engagement with the African continent. Um, now, I, I think I see the, the potential benefit that comes from Russia's engagement on the continent helping to perhaps uh, tip the balance of forces in the direction of enabling Africa to continue an agenda which allows for stabilization and security that will bring the development agenda forward. But my worry is also that it opens the door for the potential of Africa being used as a ground for proxy type engagement by foreign forces. Um, and and the, the kinds of dynamics that we're seeing in Syria playing themselves out not only in North Africa, but also perhaps in some of the sub-Saharan African countries. I wondered if you could comment on that and talk a little bit more about um, Russia's intentions with regards to the security agenda and what it is you think the African Union can do using the African standby force to try and prevent Africa becoming a breeding ground or an opportunity for that kind of foreign engagement. Thank you. Can I ask that you just introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Richard Smith. I'm with the Southern African Liaison Office, a civil society organization that tries to do policy dialogue. Uh, well, thank you for very, very different questions. I will take them in chronological order. Um, the, the technologies of smart cities and uh, all other technologies that are used in the modern uh, uh, city uh, environment. It is a very complex issue um, and I think that there is a tremendous potential for cooperation and uh, all kinds of interaction uh, between uh, uh, in particular my country and the African continent in general as a whole. We know that uh, by the end of uh, this century if everything goes well, inshallah, uh, the uh, largest cities will be in Africa. Well, there are of course different estimates uh, by different experts, but uh, uh, some cities at least uh, uh, among the biggest ten will be here, like Lagos, uh, Cairo and others. Um, in recent uh, years, uh, Russia uh, has spent a lot of uh, attention and efforts and resources to develop uh, this part of uh, social economy. Let's say it like this. Uh, and uh, we have achieved uh, certain successes, um, in particular uh, in, in Moscow area. I'm no, not uh, going to comment on some negative aspects because uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, evidently some. Uh, in our case, uh, we have this, uh, no, not megapolis, but gigapolis, uh, which is Moscow. 
Uh, apparently, uh, the number of inhabitants is closing to 25 million, uh, and, and so on and so on. One of the elements is that uh, it is the only place in the country that attracts so much investments in this uh, sphere. Um, whether it is a healthy development, whether it is a sustainable development, uh, how it uh, impacts, uh, influences the development of other regions of the country, I'm not uh, taking this. But Moscow itself is uh, a, a quite a success story. And uh, it is uh, easily one of the five, the most uh, digitalized world, uh, cities in the world, with uh, many, many, many features uh, already installed and in place, working, making part of the daily life of the Moscovites, but also many coming. And uh, the pace of development is uh, sometimes scary to people uh, in a decent age, like myself, for example. I'm, I'm, I have difficulties following all the developments uh, uh, that, that are coming up and taking place in the city. Um, I think that uh, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, areas, uh, specific areas, um, including security, and I'm coming to the second question, uh, including security in the big cities that uh, are of interest. Uh, to all sides, and uh, we can exchange uh, experience. And um, of course, uh, in the 90s, in the years 2000, we mostly had uh, delegations from uh, our cities and the towns visiting uh, abroad and uh, learning from uh, the experience that was accumulated yeah, by other countries and uh, other capitals and large cities. Now, we have delegations from the Russian Federation mostly coming to Moscow to, 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 have, uh, to study uh, its experience, and um, from more and more delegations from uh, other countries uh, coming to, to see what Moscow did and how it per performed in, in these um, high-tech areas related to the uh, daily life of big cities. Now, security, of course, is a crucial element you don't need anything else if you don't have security, as, as we said. And um, it has uh, many dimensions. I mean, I, I, I think I got your hint, sir, about uh, foreign proxy engagement. Uh, I wonder just if you were so, uh, so attentive to these issues throughout your professional career. I hope so. But then, if you have studied, uh, obviously you have, because you are, you are, you are concerned. Uh, if you have studied uh, the um, uh, activities of different private uh, military companies in the world, in particular in Africa, you have all the grounds to be concerned, of course. Yes, but um, uh, as I said, there are many uh, dimensions to, to security issues, and I would like in particular to talk in more details about one. Even in the 90s and the years 2000, when I said uh, that uh, Russia had to look more inward and uh, we could not physically, materially be providing the same assistance to, to, other, uh, uh, to our uh, partners in Africa in particular, but in other parts of the world as well, we were still um, very conscious uh, um, about uh, providing the uh, intangible kind of assistance in the security area. And that, unfortunately, mostly remained uh, unknown, unnoticed, and unappreciated by our partners. But if you take, in particular, uh, the deliberations that uh, mostly remain uh, hidden from uh, the outside uh, public in the UN Security Council, then other diplomats will, will corroborate my, my words uh, that uh, we were engaged, all these years, we were engaged in very, very difficult discussions in protecting, uh, for example, uh, such 
purposes and principles and goals of the UN Charter as uh, sovereignty and sovereign equality of states, the principle of non-interference into domestic affairs, and even the principle of uh, African uh, solutions to African problems. We had really to fight for it uh, in heavy diplomatic battles. Many of these discussions, uh, as I said, uh, uh, remained unknown. But uh, it's us and China and non-permanent members, some of the non-permanent members of the UN Security Council, of course, uh, who bore the, the, the burden of, of uh, this uh, political engagement, uh, diplomatic engagement uh, in, in uh, the UN. And uh, we did our best to protect the interests of African countries in particular. Um, so some ideas that are now um, aimed at uh, reforming the UN Security Council would actually uh, be, be uh, counterproductive for their authors. Now coming uh, to to this uh, specific uh, issue of uh, proxy engagement uh, and Russian intentions. There are no intentions. Um, we, we said uh, by, by our president, uh, through our president, that we are uh, uh, experts in some areas and we are eager to share this expertise. If anybody doesn't want it, it, it won't be there, very simple. Russian experts, Russian military do not go if they are not invited, uh, do not go anywhere. It's only by the invitation of uh, certain governments like in Syria, like uh, in Central African Republic, for example, that uh, they appear. And uh, this is, uh, the fundamental principle that we follow uh, every time and uh, everywhere. Thank you. What are the underlying principles that guides Russia's African policy? And if you have that policy, what then is the strategic objective that Russia thinks can emerge from that policy in the African continent? Uh, taking a defensive stance, I would say that uh, I, I attempted to answer this kind of question uh, in, in, in my introductory remarks, in my uh, uh, short speech. Well, uh, I, what I could add is perhaps that uh, there is um, there is, a, as we say, a renewed basis for cooperation with African states. There is no ideology as such. Um, no uh, attempts uh, to spark the world revolution or something like that. We are ready to interact on a very pragmatic base on, on the uh, foundation of mutual interests, taking into account um, interests of our partners, first of all, and, uh, of course, uh, uh, on the condition that uh, Russian interests would also be taken uh, into consideration as well. Um, as I said, we are ready to cooperate on an equal footing. Um, we think that fundamental uh, for this relationship are principles or of uh, non-intervention into internal affairs, mutual respect, uh, respect for the international law um, and, and uh, other uh, values and principles that we share uh, on in internationally. And uh, I, I enumerated most of them, perhaps, maybe not all, uh, but, uh, well, this is uh, a renewed basis, as, as we think. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so perhaps I can take the opportunity to ask Dr. Pahad a question. Um, in recent years in South Africa, um, South Africa's engagement with Russia has been particularly colored by the so-called nuclear deal that wasn't, or was prevented from happening. Um, and much of the you know, conjecture and a lot of the suspicion that emanated from that was about the allegations of corruption attached to that deal. And certainly, I think a lot of the murkiness and the lack of transparency around it. I think it's well established that the infrastructure deficit in South Africa and indeed in the rest of the continent will require foreign assistance. But how do we then, sitting here in South Africa, ensure that we enter into these relationships on an equal footing? We're hearing from the ambassador that the Russians are saying we are equal partners here. But often these kinds of relationships are prone to manipulation, if not by foreign uh, agents, but certainly then from uh, you know, unscrupulous politicians who are looking to just make a quick buck off of it. So how do we ensure that these relationships ultimately benefit the people they are meant to? No, look, that's a, perhaps an almost impossible question to answer because the capacity of individual countries, whether it's South Africa or anybody else, to be able to play an independent role and protect its own independent interests on its own, I don't think it's possible. And certainly if South Africa ever thought that by itself it can resist these things, then it's living in the dream world. So for me, the most important thing then would then lie in what kind of relations we have with other countries, what do we do with the United Nations, what do we do with other international organizations, what do we do with the WTO, even the World Bank and uh, the IMF, given the unjust power relations that exist in those two institutions, and then working with people from the United States, from Western Europe. Our own experience of the anti-apartheid movement was that we were able to build what I consider to be the most powerful international solidarity movement history has seen. And that was because we were able to mobilize millions of people throughout the world to support our struggle. And in the end, we also have to work together, in my view, in using my language, with progressive forces in the United States of America and Western Europe, and they are there. Uh, incidentally, I, m maybe it was on RT News, so maybe it was fake news, I don't know, but about a few weeks ago, they said there was some survey of young people in the United States of America, and in that survey, a majority of the young people said they want a socialist society. Now, that was a huge surprise to me. But it tells you something that we might not be able to see from the way the media and others report developments, that there may well be a groundswell of opinion, even in a place like the United States of America, for more progressive policies in the interest of humanity as a whole. So to answer your question, no, South Africa on its own will daydream if it thinks it can do it. We can only do it in con conjunction with other forces and other countries in which we have common aims and common objectives, and that would be to really bring about a safer and a better world for everybody. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, throw open uh, the opportunity to all of you to ask a final question if you'd like. Thank you. It's Adam Dady from the British Embassy. Um, given our host of the seminar, I wanted to ask a little bit around uh, Russia's cooperation with China, um, with and in South Africa. Many of us will have noticed the, uh, the naval exercise between the three countries this month. I just wondered what uh, you saw that meaning for cooperation between the three countries going forward, uh, militarily or wider. Thank you. 
Well, per perhaps the answer uh, won't be what you expected, but uh, I can very briefly say that we can and will cooperate in every area where uh, the three of us will agree on, military or whatever else. Um, before I call Professor Peng Yi to um, do the vote of thanks, but, um, one last question from me. When I started my career as a journalist, I remember covering um, you know, a groundswell of opinion, particularly building in South Africa for UN reform. Um, and about, uh, you know, especially pushing for a permanent seat um, on the Security Council for an African state. Um, so many years later, I feel like I've aged at least 50 years in that time, um, and we're still very much where we were then. There does not seem to be any concrete movement. It se certainly seems to be very little political will, um, you know, to re, uh, you know, to reopen those engagements in a serious way. Um, and yet, the you know, the future of multilateralism, mul multilateralism in the world, and the future certainly of African states being able to engage the rest of the world in an equal footing dep depends on such things. How can Russia, um, you know, contribute? Shall we contribute more? You think? Huh? Right now, it's not enough. Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? I mean, well, yes, there are discussions in the um, uh, United Nations about reform in many different areas, and uh, some uh, structural or rather bureaucratic or administrative changes take place, and uh, some uh, uh, peacekeeping or, and, or other operations are closed. Some are comments uh, and, and so on and so on. You see different programs developing and, 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 and so on. In the area of security, if you relate to the reform of the UN Security Council, now uh, our position is very clear and it is very simple and we think that it reflects uh, the, the opinion of uh, the most countries, uh, of most of the countries, and uh, this is that uh, the decision should be taken uh, only on a basis of a very, very uh, broad agreement. Something very close to consensus, if not by consensus itself. Um, but there are different areas uh, where um, the UN needs a reform or the reform is um, uh, some some uh, elements of reform are uh, obviously needed, like uh, there are uh, so such terms in the UN Charter as enemy states. So what we have in the UN Charter, in the UN system, reflects uh, to a large extent uh, the realities uh, and um, the need for uh, security throughout the world uh, stemming from the results of the Second World War. And if you look into the UN Charter, you will see that it, the, among the first things it says that uh, humanity conscious to prevent the horrors of war, meaning of course the next World War, decides this and states, uh, participating states, uh, member states decide this and this and this, and uh, they have uh, outlaid all these ideas in, uh, and provisions in the UN Charter. So, does this system work? Uh, to us, it does work. So we didn't have, uh, thanks God, this, uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, fathers of the Charter, uh, we didn't have this third a third world war. So it works. Uh, it uh, may be not so, so happy uh, working in uh, different areas like social and economic affairs, human rights, uh, science and technology and, and so on. Disarmament for many reasons and arms control. Uh, so um, yes, uh, new elements of course the system should, should get modernized. Uh, and brought to the modern day standards, but there are things that are fundamental and uh, that are crucially important for uh, the system, that, that uh, security system of the world in general.
and it should be looked at uh, uh, from the point of view of the world security, not interests of a state or a, a group of states. Thank you very much to both speakers. Please join me in applauding both of them. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our center's honor to host such an important seminar on the topic of Africa-Russian relations. I would like to thank the Ambassador Rogoshev, the former Minister Pahad, and our Chair Patel, staff of our Center for Africa-China Studies, especially Dr. Basso, the staff of Russian Embassy, and all of you for your coming. Please kindly keep contact with us. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Please enjoy the lunch. Thank you.